part four seven ways to cultivate a mental attitude that will bring you peace and happiness chapter 12 eight words that can transform your your life a few years ago i was asked to answer these questions on a radio program what is the biggest lesson you have ever learned that was easy by far the most vital lessons i have ever learned in the importance of what you think if i knew what you think i would know what you are our thoughts make us what we are our mental attitude is the x factor that determine our fate emerson said a man is what he thinks about all day long how could he possibly be anything else i know I now know with a conviction beyond all doubt that the biggest problem you and I have to deal with, in fact, almost the only per problem we have to deal with is choosing the right thought. If we can do that, we will be on the high road to solving all our problems. The greatest philosopher who ruled the Roman Empire, Marcus, Aurelius summed it up in eight words words that can determine your destiny our life is what our thoughts make it yes if we think happy thoughts we will be happy if we think miserable thought we will be miserable if we fear thought we will be fearful if we think sickly thought we will probably be ill if we think failure we will certainly fail if we follow in self-pity everyone will want to shun us and avoid us you are not sat norman vincement hale you are not what you think you are but what you think you are Am I advocating an habitual Pollyanna attitude towards all our problems? No, unfortunately, life isn't so simply as all that. But I am advocating that we assume a positive attitude instead of a negative attitude. In other words, we need to be conserved about concerned about our problems but not worry what is the difference between concern and worry let me illustrate every time i cross the traffic jam street of new york i am concerned about what i am doing but not worried concern means realizing what the problems are and calmly taking a step to meet them worrying means going around in maddening futile circles a man can be concerned about his serious problem and still walk with his chin up and a carnation in his buttonhole. I have seen Lowell Thomas do just that. I once had the privilege of being associated with Lowell Thomas in presenting his famous film of on the Alan B. Lawrence campaign in World War I. He and his assistant had photographed the war on half a dozen front and best of all had brought back a pictorial record of B. E. Lawrence and his colorful Arabian army and a film record of Alan by conquest of the Holy Land. He illustrates talk entitled with Alan Bay in Palestine and Lawrence in Arabia were a sensation in London and around the world. The London Opera season was postponed for six weeks so that he could continue telling his, his tale of high adventure. And showing his picture at Covent Garden Royal Opera House. After his sensational success in London came in triumphant tour of many countries, then he spent two years preparing a film record of life in India and Afghanistan. After a lot of incredibly bad luck, the 
impossible happened. He found himself built in London. I was with him at the time. I remember we had to eat chips meal at cheap restaurant. We couldn't have eaten even there if we had not borrowed money from a Scotsman James M. B. The renowned artist here is the point of the story even when Lowell Thomas was facing huge debts and severe disappointment he was concerned about but not worried. He knew that if he let his resources get him down, he would be worthless to everyone, including his creditors. So each morning before he started out, he bought a flower, put it in his buttonhole, and went swinging down Oxford Street with his head high and his staff spirited. He taught positive, courageously thought, and refused to let defeat defeat him. To him, being lick was all part of the game, the useful training you had to expect if you wanted to get to the top. Our mental attitude has an almost unbelievable effect even on our physical power. The famous British psychiatrist J. A. Hatfield gives a striking illustration of that fact in this splendid book, The Psychology of Power. I asked three men he write to submit themselves to test the effect of mental suggestion on their strengths, which was measured by gripping a dynam dynamometer. He told them to grip the dynamometer with all their might. He had them do this under three different sets of conditions. When he tested them under normal working condition, their average grip was 101 pound. When he tested them after he had hypnotized them and told them that they were very weak, they could grip only 29 pounds, less than a third of their normal strength. One of these men was a price was a prize fighter and when he was told under hypnosis that he was weak, he remarked that his arm felt tiny just like a baby. When Captain Hatfield then tested these men a third time, telling them under hypnosis that they were very strong, they were able to grip an average of 142 pounds. When their mind were filled with positive thought of strength, they increased their actual physical power almost 500 percent such is the incredible power of our mental attitude to illustrate the magic power of thought let me tell you one of the most astounding stories in the annal of america i could write a book about it but let be brief on a frosty october night shortly after the close of the civil war a homeless destitute woman who was little more than a Wanderer on the face of the earth knock at the door of Mother Webster, the wife of the retired sea captain living in Amesbury, Manchester. Manchester. Opening the door, Mother Webster saw a frail little creature. Scaredly more than a hundred pounds of frightened skin and bones. The stranger, Mr. Glover, explained she was seeking a home where she could think and work out a great problem that absorbed her day and night. Why not stay here? Miss Webster replied, I am all alone in this big house. Miss Glover might have remained indefinitely with Mother Webster if the latter son-in-law, Bill Ellis, hadn't come up from New York for a vacation. When he discovered Miss Glover's presence, he shouted, I'll have no vagabond in this house, and he shoved 
this homeless woman out of the door a driving rain was falling she stood shivering in the rain for a few minutes and then started down the road looking for shelter here is the astonishing part of the story the vagabond whom bill ellis put out of the house was destined to have as much as influence on the thinking of the world as any other woman who ever walked this earth she is now known to millions of devoted followers as mary baker eddy the founder of christian science yet until this time she had known little in life except sickness sorrow and tragedy her first husband had died shortly after their marriage her second husband had deserted her and enveloped with a married woman he later died in a poor house she had only one child a son and she was forced because of poverty illness and jealousy to give him up when he was 4 years old she lost all track of him and never saw him again for 31 years because of her own ill health Miss Eddy had been interested for years in what she called the science of mind healing but the dramatic turning point in her life occurred in Lane Manchester walking downtown one cold day she slipped and fell on the icy pavement and was knocked unconscious her spine was so injured that she was convulsed with stamps even the doctor expected her to die if by some miracle she lived he declared that she would never walk again living on what was supposed to be her that bad mary baker addy opened her bible and was led she declared by divine guidance to read these words from saint matthew and behold and they brought to him a man sick of the palsy laying on a bed and jesus said unto the sick of the palsy son be good be of good cheer they sin be forgiven he arise take up the bed and go on to thine house and he arose and departed to his house these word of jesus she declared produced within her such a strength such a faith such a surge of healing power that she immediately got out of bed and walked that experience miss addy declared was the falling apple that led me to the discovery of how to be well myself and how to move others so i gained the scientific certainty that all Causation was mind and every effect a mental phenomena. Such was the way in which Mary Baker Eddy became the founder and high priestess of a new religion, Christian Science, the only great religion faith ever established by a woman, a religion that has encircled the globe. You are probably saying to yourself, "By own this man Carnegie is proselytizing for Christian Science." No, you are wrong. I am not a Christian scientist, but the longer I live, the more deeply I am convinced of the tremendous power of thought. As a result of thirty-five years spent in teaching adults, I know men and women can banish worry. fear and various kind of illness and can transform their life by changing their thoughts i know i know and i have seen such incredible transformation perform hundreds of times i've seen them so often that i no longer wonder at them for example one of these transformation happened to one of my students Franken J Wally of 1469 West Idaho Street St Paul Minnesota he had a nervous breakdown what brought it on worry Frank J 
really tell me I worried about everything I worried because I was too thin because I thought I was losing my hair because I fear I would never make enough money to get married because I felt I would never make a good father because I fear I was losing the girl I wanted to marry because I felt I was not living a good life I worry about the impression I was making on other people I worried because I thought I had stomach ulcers I could no longer work I gave up my job I built my tension inside me until I was like a boiler, boiler without a safety wall the pressure got so unbearable that something had to give and and it did if you have never had a nervous breakdown, pray God that you never do, for no pain of the body can exceed the excruciating pain of an ag agonished mind. My breakdown was so severe that I couldn't talk even to my family. I had no control over my thought. I was filled with fear. I would jump at the slightest noise. I avoided everybody. I would break out crying for no apparent reason at all. Every day was one of the agony. I felt that I was deserted by everybody, even God. I was tempted to jump into the river and end it all. I decided instead to take a trip to Florida, hoping that a change of scene would help me. As I stepped on the train, my father handed me a letter and told me, not to open it until I reach Florida. I landed in Florida during the height of the tourist season. Since I couldn't get in a hotel, I rented a sleeping room in a garage. I tried to get a job on a tram fighter out of Miami, but had no luck. So I spent my time at the beach. I was more rich in Florida than I had been at home. So I opened the envelope to see what Dad had written. His note said, Son, you are 1,500 miles from home and you don't feel any different, do you? I knew you wouldn't because you took with you the one thing that is cause of all your trouble. That is yourself. There is nothing wrong with either your body or your mind. It is not the situation you have met that have thrown you it is what you think of the situation as a man think it in his heart so is he when you realize that son come home for you will be cured that letter made me angry. I was looking for sympathy, not instruction. I was so mad that I decided then and there that I could never go home that night as I was walking down one of the side streets of Miami. I came to church where services were going on, having no place to go. I drifted in and listened to a sermon on the text. He who conquer his spirit in my tear, then he who take it a city sitting in the sanctity of the house of God and hearing the same thought that my dad had written in his letter all this swept the accumulated letter out of my brain. I was able to think clearly and sensibly for the first time in my life. I realized that a fool I had been. I was shocked to see myself in the true light here. I was wanting to change the whole world and everyone in it. But the only thing that needed changing was the focus of the lens of the camera, which was my mind. The next morning, I packed and started home. A week later, I was back on the job. Four months later, I married the girl I had been afraid of losing. We now have a happy family of five children. God has been good to me both materially and mentally. 
At the time of the breakdown, I was night foreman of a small department handling 18 people. I am now super in superintendent of cart and manufacturing charge of over 450 people. Life is much fuller and friendlier. I believe I appreciate the true value of life now when movement of uneasiness try to creep in as they will in everyone's life. I tell myself to get that camera back in focus and everything is okay. I can honestly say that I am glad I had the breakdown because I found out the hard way what power our thoughts can have over our mind and our body. Now I can make my thoughts work for me instead of against me. I can see now that that was right when he said it was an outward situation that had caused all my suffering but what I thought of those situations and as soon as I realized that I was cured and stayed cured, such was the experience of Frank J. Reilly.